Let me start with a, a slide that you probably are familiar with. So every year in Davos, there is the World Economic Forums, and uh, most uh, CEOs from leading companies are asked to fill a survey about what are the most relevant risks they perceive for their company. Uh, and in the list, there are uh, several items that relate to uh, climate, basically, environmental damages and climate, with the exception of uh, uh, asset bubbles and the cyber attacks. In a way or, or the other, all the other uh, elements up there are related to climate. Even large-scale involuntary migration <laughs> is actually a climate issue, because the largest driver of uh, uh, involuntary immigration is uh, actually climate. So climate is definitely on the mind of the top CEOs uh, of the world. And when we speak about climate and climate risk, we should make a distinction between uh, the physical risk, and this morning there were already some interesting paper on that, so heat waves or floods, and a separate class of risk, it is the policy risk. So all the policies that try to tackle climate, uh, the most relevant form of policy for uh, uh, dealing with climate change is uh, carbon pricing. So uh, many countries in the world, this is a map from the World Bank, are uh, currently pricing carbon or have already committed to price carbon in the uh, next few years. Uh, finally, China has joined the, the club of uh, uh, carbon pricing country, and this is going to be important for us. Unfortunately, the U.S. is still in the gray area. We hope that uh, in the next five years, if Trump gets reelected, uh, we are going to have uh, some serious policy for uh, climate in the U.S. as well. Uh, but carbon pricing in the form of either carbon tax or carbon trade is uh, getting uh, relevant, real. Uh, so the question for, uh, in, uh, for our paper is, uh, given this uh, threat for companies, the carbon risk uh, threat for companies, to what extent uh, markets are uh, incorporated this threat from a credit risk point of view? Uh, I will not be able to really summarize the literature on the field. Uh, uh, we know that there are already very relevant, clear contributions about the relationship between uh, uh, climate risk, uh, carbon risk, and uh, share prices. Uh, I have to say that uh, maybe the relationship between uh, climate risk and uh, uh, fixed income or loans is, uh, to a certain extent, uh, less studied uh, so far. We have already some contribution that show that, to a certain extent, uh, uh, climate risk is factored in the pricing of uh, syndicated loans. And uh, uh, we have also some evidence of, uh, evidences about uh, the integration of uh, uh, CO2 emission level in the pricing of uh, uh, bank loans. Uh, we decided to get a sort of more uh, comprehensive uh, approach to uh, quantifying and, and studying the relationship between uh, uh, climate risk and uh, uh, um, credit worthiness of companies. Uh, this, we think, is also important because there is a, a huge debate right now going on uh, at the policy-making level. Uh, Bank of England in December just enacted a new policy for, uh, uh, for all the UK banks that have to implement certain measures to take, uh, consider climate risk in their policies. The European uh, Commission is uh, discussing uh, it further. There are some bold proposals from the French government. So this is an um, important topic at policy making level, unfortunately not in all the countries. And also this is important because of the current discussion about the possible role of uh, central banks, the possible role of uh, uh, monetary green policies and uh, uh, the so-called so green quantitative easing. So to understand a little bit better what is the relationship between a climate risk and uh, 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 credit risk of companies, we uh, 
uh, we think is uh, important. So this is our main question. Does the exposure to climate risks affect corporate credit worthiness? Yes or no? Or we will try to convince you that the answer uh, is yes. Uh, let's start with the, the basic. First problem is to, uh, to measure the credit risk for a company. Uh, I know that most of the people uh, are already familiar with, uh, with the topic. Uh, in literature, there are two sort of kind of models. There are so-called structural models and the so-called reduced form models. So the structural models uh, they, um, calculate the probability of default uh, on the basis of the value of the assets of, of the company. Uh, the, uh, the idea of the structural model comes uh, from Robert Merton uh, and uh, is an application basically of the Black and Scholes option pricing uh, uh, model uh, to uh, default behavior of companies. Uh, there is a very popular version of uh, uh, structural models that is called KMV model, and uh, uh, this is currently uh, is uh, currently owned by Moody's. And uh, uh, basically, most of the uh, the rating agencies use uh, similar models in uh, their uh, their uh, analysis. Um, I will probably uh, skip because, given the audience is a little bit redundant, the, uh, uh, the explanation of the uh, KMV model. Um, I want just to, to pick this one. This is our uh, the metric we use for uh, credit worthiness: is the distance to default. So, is a way to quantify the probability of default for uh, for a certain company. Uh, distance to default, uh, bear in mind that means that the more uh, a company is, distance, uh, is distant from default, the better. Uh, so uh, we are looking uh, at the relationship between a carbon risk and the distance uh, to default of companies in our sample. Uh, our sample, um, we started using a companies included in the Bloomberg Berkeley's Aggregate Corporate Index. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, one of the most widely used indexes for uh, corporate bonds investors uh, in the world. Uh, and so we, th we thought of starting from uh, uh, basically the, the components of this index. Uh, we dropped from the uh, list of constituents um, uh, junk bonds, so companies, uh, uh, speculative grade uh, rated companies, and also financial companies. Uh, in total, we uh, have four, 458 companies observed from 2008 to 2018. Uh, for the calculation of the distance to default and other variables that uh, are used as controls, we use uh, uh, usual suspects or uh, uh, data stream. Uh, the data on emissions that for us are, uh, are really a key element, are the core of, of the research, are from uh, Asset4, that is part of uh, uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, unfortunately, probably some of the people have worked on this data. Uh, the, the coverage is not optimal. We have, uh, especially for uh, years uh, before 2000, uh, 13, the coverage is, is not great, so unfortunately we lost a lot of observations because we could not really have uh, uh, reliable data about the emissions, uh, and this is definitely a source of bias in the construction of our, of our sample, uh, but uh, the, this is uh, the best we could, could do. Uh, so, first the result. Uh, this is uh, just a, a simple graph showing the relationship uh, between uh, carbon emissions and uh, distance to default in uh, our sample. Uh, as you can see, there is a, a pretty clear linear relationship. So uh, quintile one are the lowest emitting companies. Quintile five are the highest emitting companies and we have the distance to default on the y-axis. So the uh, least emitting companies are actually the most 
distant to default. So they are the strongest company from a credit, uh, credit worthiness point of view. And the contrary is uh, true. So for quintile one, so the high polluters, high emitting companies have the worst credit uh, profile situation. And as you can see, uh, sort of, there is a sort of uh, uh, linear relationship between these two elements. So the carbon footprint on the one side and the quality of the credit on the other side. Um, so we run a, a simple regression model. Here again, our dependent variable is the distance uh, to default for uh, a firm I at time T. And then uh, we uh, have as independent variables the uh, um, amount of carbon emitted, so the amount of emissions. We also use uh, the uh, carbon intensity, that is the ratio between uh, uh, CO2 emissions and the sales, uh, because all the, which is a pretty common measure in a literature also about the, um, as a proxy of the fle technological flexibility from uh, a, a climate point of view. And then we have uh, uh, sort of the usual suspects control we have a look at. Um, so here uh, we, we have our preliminary results. Uh, the uh, variables of interest are in particular the variables uh, related to emissions. So we have the log of emissions and the carbon uh, intensity. Um, the dependent variable, again, is the distance to default. Plus, we have uh, a number of controls that are uh, well established in the literature about uh, uh, credit risk. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, regardless of the specification, we have uh, uh, a negative sign for all the uh, measure we use for carbon footprint. So, uh, and the relationship is uh, uh, statistically significant in a strong way. So uh, we, we can see that uh, there is apparently a, a, this relationship between uh, carbon footprint and uh, distance to default. Um, of course, we, this was a sort of preliminary result. We were looking also from, uh, uh, for some uh, sort of confirmation from, uh, about the uh, causality relationship. So it's uh, really the uh, carbon footprint that affects the credit worthiness of, of, uh, of the firms. Uh, we came up with a, a series of uh, uh, sort of uh, ideas to test the causality. Uh, um, the first one is a difference in difference model. We thought of using uh, the Paris Agreement in, uh, uh, held in, uh, in Paris in 2015 as an exogenous shock. Uh, this might not convince completely the audience because this was something uh, Paris, uh, Paris COP20, so-called COP21, uh, was uh, a, um, an event planned, and so was not really a, a surprise for, uh, for, for the market, was not really exogenous. But we still thought, uh, think that since the outcome was unexpected to a certain extent, uh, the Paris Agreement could be considered to at least to a certain extent an exogenous shock. So we run our difference in difference model where the, the treatment is again the, uh, um, uh, the uh, event. Um, and in the regression here, uh, you can see uh, that the, um, the coefficient of interest is uh, uh, the one for uh, the interaction uh, variable. So post event uh, observations uh, times emissions. And you can see that definitely, uh, or apparently, uh, following the COP21, there was really a, a stronger deterioration of uh, um, the distance to default for high-emitting companies. So this uh, is a sort of uh, 
preliminary indication that uh, the, of the direction of the causality between a carbon footprint and a credit risk. Uh, we also use a, a, a sort of other robustness check. Um, uh, uh, an instrumental variable was uh, not easy to find an instrumental variable for uh, for this case, but following some uh, existing literature, we thought of using uh, the average uh, industry emissions as instrumental variable for our individual corporate emissions. Uh, as you can see, uh, both first stage, the first stage co confirm uh, the, 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 the quality of the instrument, and in the second stage, we observe that uh, the relationship, the negative relationship between uh, uh, carbon footprint and the distance to default uh, holds. Um, I have also other, uh, we have tried also other robustness checks. Uh, I have also to stress that our results hold even excluding uh, uh, oil company and energy company. So this is, this is not, the, our results are not led by the presence of a, a sort of natural candidate to uh, uh, these uh, um, possible uh, shocks because of uh, carbon policies. So I go swift to conclusions. Um, we find a, a relationship between a corporate carbon footprint and the credit profile of companies. We, uh, we, we consider that uh, uh, there are evidences uh, about the causality of the relationship. So is uh, the carbon footprint that uh, increases or determines, at least to a certain extent, the a portion of the credit risk uh, of companies. Um, we think that this result is important because there are obvious uh, uh, lessons or uh, uh, insights for, uh, for policymakers, for investors, uh, for lenders. Uh, and so the, the action taken by, for example, Bank of England or the European Commission about the regulation of uh, climate exposure of banks are actually uh, seems to be uh, seem to be uh, actually a good idea is uh, something that is uh, uh, worth pursuing um, and also uh, I mean you are going to we are going to discuss this tomorrow with uh, the green monetary policy the uh, policies this is uh, our findings are sort of a fart argument in favor of uh, having a look uh, at climate at central banks level Thank you.